sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a bunco detail. For the past year, a confidence man has been cheating women in your city. You finally get a lead on him. Your job? Get him. Tonight, I have a new report for you. A most important one, too. Because when you're asked to try a cigarette, you want to know and you ought to know what that cigarette is meant to people who smoke it all the time. After a full year of observation, a medical specialist who has given a group of Chesterfield smokers thorough examinations every two months for the full year reports no adverse effects to their nose, throat, or sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. More and more men and women all over the country are finding out every day that Chesterfield is best for them. Enjoy your smoking. Try Chesterfields today. They're best for you much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, February 12th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Bunko Detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Steed. My name's Friday. We were at the Armstrong Thomas Department Store Cafeteria, and it was 3.14 p.m. when I got back to the table. Here, Joe. Let me give you a hand. Oh, thanks. Here you are, Miss Terrence. Thank you. I wonder if you'd tell us what this is all about now, ma'am. Surely. Sorry you had to wait, but I thought it might be better if we talked up here. Yes, ma'am. Would you pass the sugar, please? Oh, yes, ma'am. Here you are. Well, it's not a pretty thing. I don't know how I could have been so foolish, but I guess when you get to be my age and you haven't got anything, almost any attention makes you forget. Yes, ma'am. How'd you first meet this man, Ben? I saw him first at a musicale. I met him very briefly that night. He called me the next day, said that he wanted to see me again. Well, I told him that I didn't think it'd be proper, but he insisted, so that night we had dinner together. He seems so nice, I still can't believe it. Yes, ma'am. Such a wonderful time. I didn't think anybody could be so happy. We ate at a wonderful little place down at the beach. Then we went for a long drive and listened to the music on the radio. Just beautiful. The way the ocean looked, all moonlight and all. Mm -hmm. When did you see him again, ma'am? Not until he left. He'd call a couple of times a day. It got a little embarrassing. The girls at the store here got to kidding me about it, but I didn't care. Then he told me he wanted to marry me. I couldn't believe it. So wonderful. Yes, ma'am. Then one day, he told me that he was going to have to take a business trip up north. When was that? Do you remember, ma'am? I guess it was about three weeks ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Well, he left. I went down to the station and saw him off. He kissed me and said that when he got back, we'd be married. We were going over to Las Vegas on our honeymoon. Wonderful plans. Wonderful. And then I heard from him, and he got to San Francisco. He called me from the hotel and said that he'd lost his wallet on the train. He told me he'd lost everything. All his money, identification, everything. Mm-hmm. That's when he asked me for the hundred dollars. I didn't think that anything was wrong, so I sent it to him. Where'd you send it, ma'am? To his hotel. Did you hear from him at all after that, ma'am? Not a word. At first, I thought that maybe he was just busy. I did think it was kind of funny that he wouldn't say something about getting the money I sent, but 
Not a word. Then I got worried. Yes, ma'am, I understand. Finally, I called the hotel, and they told me that he'd checked out. I figured that maybe he was back in town and wanted to surprise me. So I called his apartment. The landlady told me that he had left a couple of weeks before, that he didn't leave any forwarding address. Yes, ma'am. I didn't know what to think. I didn't want to believe that he'd just used me, but there didn't seem to be anything else to think. Yes, ma'am. Then, of course, it was only a hundred dollars. Seems that if he'd wanted to rob me, he could have asked for more. I still don't believe it, even when I know it's true. Yes, ma'am. Now, I wonder if you could give us a description of the man. Yes, I can do that. Let's see. He was tall. About how tall, ma'am? Over six feet, maybe six feet two. Uh, he had blonde hair, mm -hmm. kind of wavy. About how much would you say he weighed, Miss Terrence? I'd just be guessing, but I'd say about 190 or so. I see. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to come down to the city hall and look at some pictures for us. You think you might have one of him? It's possible, ma'am. Maybe it'd make you feel a little better to know that you're not the only woman that this Benton has taken. There have been quite a few. I guess I knew that. Even if I didn't want to believe it, I guess I knew it was just a confidence game. Such a cruel thing, though, to use a person's loneliness to rob them. Yes, ma'am, it is. When you get along in years and you haven't got anything to hold on to, a little attention and affection makes you forget everything else. Nothing else seems to matter. Yes, ma'am. I guess that's the way they figure it. Frank and I had been looking for Jonathan Benton for the past year. During that time, he'd taken approximately $37,000 from women in the Los Angeles area. His method of operation was to answer the ads in the personal columns of the daily papers. He'd give the woman a whirlwind courtship, then under the pretext of having to clean up some business before marriage, he'd leave town. He'd call the next day and give them the story about losing his wallet and identification. He'd ask them for $100. This in itself was to throw off the suspicions of the victims. In the event that they suspected that they were being taken in a racket, $100 was small enough so that their fears were quieted. Benton would answer about 20 to 30 of these ads at a time, and the request for money would hit all of the suspects at once. We'd had several complaints lately, and there was no way of knowing how many women were being taken and were too embarrassed to report it to the authorities. 4.30 p.m. We drove Miss Terrence back to the city hall and had her check the mug books. She was unable to give us an identification, however. Another month passed. During that time, we received 14 more complaints. In all instances, the description of the suspect matched that of Jonathan Benton. All available sources of information were checked. Bulletins had been gotten out carrying his description and the name he used. No results. On Wednesday, March 25th, we got a call that a man answering Benton's description had placed an ad in the personal columns of one of the daily papers. He'd used the name of Thomas Conant. The clerk at the ad counter gave us his address, and at 5.32 p.m., Frank and I went out to talk to him. Yeah? You Thomas Conan? Yeah, that's right. What can I do for you? Police officers would like to talk to you. Well, sure, come on in. Always glad to talk to the law. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do, Mr. Smith? How do you do, sir? If you boys will come on in, I'll shut the door. Thank you. And uh, now, what's this all about? Well, sir, did you put this ad in the paper? Well, let me see. Uh... Texas cowman desires to meet petite young lady object companionship. Spelled everything right to dead. Yes, sir, that's mine. I wrote it all myself. How long have you been in Los Angeles? Well, now, let's see. Got in on the bus last Tuesday. That'd make a week and a day. Uh-huh. What brings you out here? Well, I guess you could say it's kind of a business trip. Got a little tired of the same faces back home, so I thought I'd just see what the rest of the country looked like. What little A's of it. I'm from Texas, you know. Amarillo. Yeah. What's all this about, anyway? Some law I broke? No, it's about that ad. Oh, you found out, huh? Beg your pardon? Oh, you found out about me saying I was a cattle man. That's it, ain't it? What do you mean? Well, now, I didn't mean to harm. I do have a couple milk cows on the place. A Holstein and a Guernsey. Uh, they're real nice, too. It, it, just that I was so darn lonesome, I kind of thought this might be a way to meet some nice gal. I didn't mean to harm. You can see that, can't you? Yes, yeah, sir, I guess so. wonder if you'd mind taking a ride with us, sir. Well, I should say not. Always happy to go along with the law. Uh, where do you figure to go to? We'd like you to meet somebody. 
Well, now that's right nice of you. Got some gal you'd like me to meet, huh? Well, it's not exactly that, sir. Well, it don't matter none. I got nothing to do anyhow. Just sitting here wondering if I get any replies to the ad. All right, sir. If you wouldn't mind, let's go. Not at all. I'll get my hat. Don't hardly feel conspicuous in this hat at all. Is that right? Yep. Kind of thought people might make something of it, but they hardly even notice it. Had two little kids come up today, ask for my autograph. <laughs> Guess they figured I was a movie star. Made me feel real good, too. Then I wrote my name for them. They didn't know who I was. But that didn't make no mind to them. They just thanked me and went on about the business. Right nice little folks they was. Yeah, well, let's go. Sure. Real nice people here in L.A. Real nice. Haven't met a bad one yet. Well, you haven't been here long. We got them. Five forty p.m. We drove Thomas Conant downtown and had a car go out and pick up Miss Terrence. While we talked to Conant in the interrogation room, she walked by the open door and looked in at the suspect. She told us that he was not the man who'd victimized her. She was returned to her home, and after Conant had been checked through R and I, he was released. The next morning, Frank and I ran down a tip from an informant, but it led us nowhere. Ten eighteen a.m. We checked back into the office. You get the latest bulletin from San Francisco, Joe? Yeah, I looked it over this morning. They checked out the hotel Benton was staying at. He checked out of there. They haven't seen him since. Well, that means he's probably back here in town, huh? Well, if he is, we should start hearing about him again pretty soon. I'll get it. Funko Friday. Who? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Terrence, I remember. Yes, ma'am. Where was that? Uh, would you give me that again? Yes, ma'am. Four eight Vine. Uh-huh. Yes, that's right, ma'am. We'll get in touch with you. Right. Thank you very much. Bye. Grace Terrence? Yeah, she just saw Benton. Where? Went into an apartment out on Vine Street. Ten forty-one a.m. Frank and I got to the apartment house on Vine Street. We talked to the landlord, and he told us that a man answering the suspect's description was registered in apartment four B. He was registered under the name Jonathan Benson. He told us that this Benson had just moved in and paid his first month's rent in advance. He'd said that he was just going to be in town for a short time, and that in the event that he moved out before his month was up. He expected no refund. Frank and I went up to the fourth floor and knocked on the door. Yeah? You Jonathan Benson? Who are you? Police officers want to talk to you. What about? Might be better if we talked inside. Maybe I don't want you in my All place. right, now, mister, you get your hat. We want to talk to you downtown. What for? Come on, get your hat. Just a minute. I think maybe there's been some kind of mistake here. Just tell me exactly what it is you're looking for. I'm sure we can work Come on, out. mister. Quit stalling. Get your hat, will you? Come on in. I'll get my hat. I'll get it for you. In this closet? Yeah, the gray one. You sure you got the right man? Looks that way. Mm-hmm. No way to work this out. What do you mean by that? Well, I don't even know why you want me to go with you. Seems you could fill me in on that. Got some people we'd like to have you meet. Who? You'll see when we get there. Here's your hat. Come on, let's go. You guys sure think you're the Gestapo coming in here dragging a private citizen out of his house. If you haven't done anything wrong, you got nothing to worry about then, have you? That's not the point. I don't like it. Coming in here and take me downtown so a lot of stupid old broads can look at me. Who said we wanted women to look at you? You did. No, we said we wanted you to meet some people. Must have misunderstood, huh? Yeah, I guess you did. Um, no way we can work this out, huh? There's no way. Now, come on. Oh, just a minute. I want to be sure I got my key. I don't want to be locked out. Don't worry about it. What do you mean? You might not be coming back. Frank and I took Jonathan Benson downtown. We ran him through R&I, but we got no identification. His fingerprints were rolled and checked, but they didn't make him. Miss Terrence was called and asked to come down to the city hall to try to identify the suspect. 2.30 p.m., we took him to the interrogation room. You ever use the name Benton? No. You sure? Yeah. You ever use any other alias? Why should I? You tell us. Now, look, why don't you come off it? Tell me what this is all about. You told us you just got into town, is that right? Yeah, I've been here about a week. Where'd you come from? Up north. Where up north? San Francisco. You live up there, do you? Most of the time, yeah. Most of the time? What's that mean? Just that. Most of the time I live in San Francisco. That hard for you guys to understand? What line of work are you in? I'm a salesman. Yeah? What do you sell? Whatever people want to buy. What are you selling now? Nothing right now. That's why I'm here. I'm looking for a deal. You know a woman named Terrence, Grace Terrence? I don't think so. Might. Why? We'd like to know. Hey, maybe I'm wrong about all of this, but it seems to me that when they taught me civics in school, they said that I had to be booked, that you had to let me go. They changed that law? No, that law's still good. Then let's stop horsing around. I got a lot of things I want to do. Fill me in on this, and then let me out of here. All right. There's been a confidence man working in the L.A. area, been taking money from women. Gives him a big pitch about wanting to marry him, and then he hits him up for a hundred bucks and leaves him. Sounds like a good wreck. He's taking a lot of money from people who haven't got it to spare. 
Offhand, I'd say I'd say a tough luck. Offhand, we'd say you're wrong. Where you look at it. Where do I fit into this little fantasy? You look good for the guy who's been pulling the deal. Me? That's right. You guys are flipping. Description matches. So I look like another guy. Everything else about you checks out. So you figure you've made me for the jobs, huh? That's what we figure. Which way's the gas chamber? Oh, come off it, fellas. You guys know you're trying to hang a bad rap on me. You know it, and so do I. Now, let's call the whole thing off. I can get out of here, and you can get to the pinochle. I'll get it. Hello, Jonathan. What? Why'd you do it, Jonathan? Why? If you wanted the money, you could have asked for it. I'd have given it to you. You didn't have to lie about what you thought. Place is full of them loonies. Is this the man, Miss Terrence? Yes, Sergeant, that's him. All right, how about it, Benson? I don't know what she's talking about. What's this bit with that's him? Loonies jumping with All right, now, Benson, I've had enough of that. Now, come off it. You've just been identified. We've got a lot more of them that we can have here. I think they'll identify you, too. Why, John? Why? Oh, get her out of here. One thing I can't stand is a woman bawling. Something comes along, I can't figure out right away they got a ball. Anything comes along, they got to cry. I'm sick of it. All right, ma'am, maybe it'd be better if you waited in our office. Yes, Sergeant. Still don't know why he did it. Why he took this way to get the money. I took this way because it was the easy way. You broads are all alike, every last one of you. Let me get a few things straight first. You say I took $100 from you, is that right? Yes. All right. I want you to think about this and think real careful. Didn't I say that I wanted to borrow the money? Isn't that what I said, borrow? Yes, that's what you said. Did I say that I'd pay the money back in any certain time? I don't know. Well, you think real good. You'll remember that I didn't. I just said that I'd pay you back. That's all. I didn't say when. I guess so. I don't... I, I don't care. There you are. Is it any crime to borrow money from a friend? I borrowed the money from her. I'll pay it back. You said you wanted to marry me. You said you loved me. Oh, come off it, Sarah. You got no beef. You got the soft light and the romantic music. You got it all. Look at you. Take a good look. Who'd want to marry you? Here, just a minute. Here. Here's a hundred bucks I borrowed. I want to pay you back. I got a hundred dollars worth of laughs from you. That much easy. Here's your dough. Now go home and have a good cry. I wouldn't marry you if you were the last woman on All right, earth. That's enough of that, Benson. You're not just kidding. This old harpy with romantic ideas. What a laugh. She thinks anybody want to marry her, and she's a loony, too. I didn't think anybody could be this mean. I didn't think anyone could be this cruel. I don't believe it. You got no choice. You know it all along. Thanks for the laughs. Come on, Miss Terrence, please. Imagine that, that old bag really thinking I'd marry him. Yeah. Real laugh. Well, anyway, she got her dough back. I said I'd pay her back. I did. You check with the rest of them. They'll tell you the same thing. I borrowed the money, that's all. I can't help it if they thought something else. I can't help it, Callan. Come on, let's get this over with. I want to get out of here. Yeah. You look upset, cop. Don't be. It won't prove anything. That's the way I it is. I got something for you, Benson. Is that right? Yeah. Someplace, sometime, you're going to make a mistake. Is that right? Yeah, and when you do, we're going to lean on you, and we're going to lean hard. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. The first cigarette to give you premium quality either way you like them. This means that king size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. Chesterfield is first to name all its ingredients, ingredients that make the best possible smoke. And Chesterfield gives you this full year scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfields. So enjoy your smoking. Change to Chesterfield today. Much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. <laughs> We had 12 of the victims of the confidence man look at Benson. All of them gave a positive identification, but verified his story that he'd borrowed the money from them. 4.25 p.m., Frank and I got in touch with the district attorney's office and talked with them. What Benson had said was true. In borrowing the money, or in saying he was borrowing it, he'd committed no violation of the law. We had to release him from custody. A month passed. During that time, we'd heard nothing more from the suspect. He'd stopped working the Dodge in the Los Angeles area. 
We contacted the San Francisco authorities and informed them of what had happened. They said that they'd be on the lookout for Benson. During the next two weeks, Frank and I worked on a ring of bunco artists that were working the obituary columns. On June 16th, we got a call from burglary division that they'd gotten a report of a theft, and talking to the victim, they'd gotten the name Jack Bentley. They checked the files on him and found that it could be Jonathan Benson. The victim, a Miss Betty Lindsay, came to our office to talk to us. I don't know why they thought that I should see you. It's just a plain theft. The officers in burglary said that they thought we might be interested in the thief, Miss Lindsay. I wonder if you'd tell us about him. Lousy crumb. This guy's a real schnook. Schnook of the first water. Yes, ma'am. What's his name, please? He called himself Bentley. Jack Bentley. What a bum. What do you look like, Miss Lindsay? Mm, tall and blonde. Kind of nice looking guy if you went for the type. I did. Now I got troubles. Oh, what a no good bum. I wonder if you'd take a look at some of the pictures we've got here and see if he's in these. Sure. I'd like to see you get him. Where are the pictures? Frank, would you get him, please? Yeah. Where'd you meet this Bentley? Do you remember? Well, I'm sort of the hostess at a place downtown over on 5th. Anyway, about two, three weeks ago, this schnook comes in, orders a couple of drinks, and he leaves. Next night, he's back again. Oh, he was a cagey one. Didn't work too fast. Took about a week to make the pitch, then he asked me out to dinner. Well, he always seemed kind of nice, so I told him I'd go. Mm -hmm. Here are the pictures, ma'am. If you just take a look through them and see if there's one of Bentley in oh, there. Sure. Let me see. No. Mm -mm, it's not. Hey, this one's kind of cute. What's he wanted for? Oh, he works the casualty racket. What's that? Gets the names of people that have died, tells their families that they ordered some stuff. What kind of stuff? Oh, pen and pencil sets, watches, cheap things. Charges a lot of money for them. Most of the people figure that it's one of the last things their loved ones wanted, so they pay the prices. The stuff's worthless. <laughs> Lousy racket. Such a nice-looking guy, too. So honest. Well, that's why it works. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, let me see. No, this one's not him. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. That's him. Ooh, what a nudnik. Ma'am? A nudnik, a real bum. But that's him, I'm sure of it. Benson. Yeah. You mean you know this guy? Yes, ma'am. What if you tell us exactly what happened? Well, sure, like I was telling you, this guy... Benson? Yes, ma'am, that's right. Jonathan Benson. Yeah, well... Anyway, he asked me out to dinner. I told him I'd go. It looked like he was pretty well fixed. I figured it wouldn't do no harm. Well, see, I don't get off till 12.30, and there ain't many places, nice places open after that. But I said, yeah, so he told me he'd pick me up. He got to club about 10 o'clock, said that he'd gotten through with whatever it was he was doing, that he came by to see if he could use my apartment to freshen up a bit. Freshen up a bit. Boy, what a way to heist the place. Oh, what a bum. Go ahead, ma'am. Well, I gave him the key of the place. He said that he'd stop at a drugstore and pick up a razor and shave and wash his face, and then he'd be back to pick me up. It's the last I ever saw of him. Mm -hmm. Walked off with a fur coat I had. Saved for three years for that coat. Cost me 900 bucks. Then he took a ring worth about 150. Diamonds. Belonged to my mother. Sure hope you get him. Nail him good. Yes, ma'am. Ooh, what a nudnik. <laughs> We continued to question Betty Lindsay. She gave us the name of one of Benson's friends. We checked on him, and he gave us the name of a girl who knew the suspect. We talked to her, and she was able to give us Benson's address. It was a rooming house on Franklin Avenue in the Hollywood area. 6.47 p.m., Frank and I went up to his room. Yeah, come on in. Should have kept my mouth shut. What do you guys want? We want to talk to you downtown, Benson. We aren't going to get on that merry-go-round again, are we? I'm getting tired of this whole deal. What are you guys trying to tell me this time? We didn't have to do it, Benson. You took care of that yourself. Is that right? Yep, you made a mistake. What is it this time? You figure I took some candy away from a blind newsboy? All news right, board? come on, Benson. Let's go. You're going to arrest me this time, or am I going as a favor? This time it's on us. You mean we're playing for keeps now? Yeah. What's the charge? Grand theft. You kidding? Nope. I really believe you're serious. That's right. You call it. Well, this is going to be interesting. If you can't prove this, I'm going to own City Hall, and the first thing I'm going to do is fire you two. You know that, don't you? Well, we'll take that chance. All right, but don't say I didn't warn you. You know, someday I'm going to write a book. Call it Some of My Best Friends Are Cops. Yeah, you do that. I will. You'll have the time. We took the suspect downtown. We talked to him for over an hour, but he'd admit nothing. Without being able to produce the stolen articles, the case would be difficult to prosecute. We had Benson take everything out of his pockets. Among his personal effects, we found a key to a locker in the subway terminal. Two men from Bunko Division took the key and went down to the terminal. They recovered a locked suitcase and brought it back to the squad room where we were questioning Benson. How about it, Benson? This yours? Never saw it before in my life. It's locked. You got a key to this, Benson? I told you it wasn't mine. What more can I say? See those keys there, huh, Frank? Yeah. 
Here. Right. I don't know what this is all going to prove. I told you the suitcase isn't mine. Yeah, that figures. That's how come the keys fit, huh? Cheap suitcase. A lot of the keys double. Is that right? Sure. Lots of times I lost the key for one suitcase, used the key from another one to open it. You ever find one of these in the case? I never saw that fur coat in my life. I haven't got the slightest idea how it got there. I want to talk to a lawyer. You're getting kind of jumpy, aren't you, Benson? Sure, I don't mind admitting it. I told you I got no idea where that coat came from, but I know you guys aren't going to believe it. You're out to get me. You said so. You're going to try everything you can do with it. You want to tell us about it now? There ain't nothing to tell. I don't know nothing about it. You don't ever give up, do you? I don't know what you're talking about. I want to see a lawyer. All right, we'll fix it so you can put that call in. We got the owner of this coat on the way down here. She's going to identify him, and that's all we need. Now, you just sit there and keep your mouth shut, will you? I'll get it. Funko, Smith. What's that? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, I remember. What? You did, huh? Well, that's swell. Glad to hear it. Well, I wouldn't know. I'm not much of an authority, I guess. I... Her name's what? Yeah. It's a nice name. Well, I'll be glad to tell him. I'm sure he'll be pleased. Thanks very much for calling. Uh, when are you leaving? I see. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Anything? Yes, that kid from Texas, you know, that uh, Thomas Conant? Oh, yeah. You mean the cattle man? Yeah. Got an answer to his ad. Is that right? Yeah. Somebody called him up. And he said that he made a real good deal for himself, and he's shipping her back to Texas. Well, you mean he found a girl? No. Bought himself another Holstein. <laughs> The story you've just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 17th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Quality throughout is what we try to put in every dragnet show, and it's what Chesterfield gives you in every cigarette. It's the first premium quality cigarette in both regular and king size. And smoking two packs a day myself, I can tell you that they're milder with a real good taste. Chesterfield. Jonathan Arthur Benson, alias Jack Bentley, was tried and convicted of grand theft. He received sentence as prescribed by law. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than one, nor more than ten years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Peggy Weber, Harry Bartell. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, make tomorrow your D-Day. Get an extra bond for defense. Step into any bank or post office and buy yourself a profitable share in America's future. As an investment, bonds are better than ever. They can help you save safely, conveniently, and profitably. So whether you already buy on the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond a month plan where you bank, get an extra bond for defense tomorrow. (laughs) 